Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. The cafe hall was filled with tobacco smoke, noise, and clinking glasses. Here came the unattractive public who could not afford to drink champagne in the hotel restaurant or who simply preferred light songs, funny pamphlets, and obscene dancing. Not everyone has to listen to Mozart. After all, there were merchants, noblemen with their ladies, two sailors, and a group of cheerful cadets in white caps and uniforms. Some were losing a game of billiards in the next room, and some were laying out cards on the table, hoping to get some easy money before the performance began. In the darkest nook, there was a company of young people, leaning back the chairs. Here sat two very young young ladies, dressed in elegant evening dress, and silhouetted like Greek goddesses, topped by their colorful hats with light felt boots that obscured the upper part of the face. Beside them, tucked leg over leg, sat their beau, a handsome young man in a black jacket, vest, and wide-brimmed hat. The girls were whispering among themselves and giggling softly, glancing at the cadets from time to time. And the young man was indifferently drawing something in his notebook only occasionally glancing in the direction of his companions. Emily, will you have enough wine? Finally, he said, putting away his sketches, you have to drive us home. Mr. Paul, wouldn't you agree? I'm drunk, I can drive better than you. Sober, the girl was charming. She smiled, showing her big white teeth. Yes, and she herself was uniformly tall and clean shaven. Her swarthy skin and curly brown hair gathered in the back gave away something un-Russian about her. Spoons, I recall. Another one came in with fur, covering her mouth with her palm and winking at the field through her sheer veil. The second young lady had a doll-like face, as if made of porcelain a head shorter than her statuesque friend. So together they made quite an amusing pair. My dear, you know that Mr. Paul does not like to remember it. Emily looked reproachfully at her friend, and they both laughed. You have jokes like teenagers. Maybe you should grow up. And finally, yawned the young man, hiding his smile badly. Apparently, the adventure at sea was really fun. What am I doing here? It would have been better to sleep off the road or to see your mother as a dove, accompanying young ladies who can't go out in public without cavaliers because they would be considered prostitutes Camille remarked. Is that what everyone considers a prostitute anyway? Paul nodded toward the billiard room. At that moment, the whirlwind in the gold-tinted bed was already flying toward their table, transforming into a blonde lavishly adorned with shiny bracelets and necklaces. What did I tell you? Joyfully read the newcomer to her freckle-covered face and gushing with excitement. I won thirty dollars at poker. Three is a lot, Paul. Well, not so much, replied the young man lazily. But can you pay for the wine? Rolled her eyes blonde, staring at the table. Why should I? Did I pay for you, boy? The blonde called the waiter over. I'd like a shot or a bottle of white rum for the young lady. Let's have a bottle. As they say, let's go out, let's go out. Finally, the stage backstage began to spread slowly. The orchestra play a popular harbor tune and dancers in bed and skirts and striped stockings ran onto the stage. Look, I'm having so much fun. I'm going to get on the stage myself, the blonde said again, snatching a shot of rum and tapping to the rhythm with the heels of her exquisite beige shoes. Hold that lunatic because she's going to get some more. Camille nodded her head in her direction. Gloria doesn't know how to have fun without a scandal. You don't know how to have fun at all. All night long you've been trying to put them on. Don't you have the guts to come over? The blonde Gloria shook her head, and her hair spread even more. Rising swiftly, she was already standing at the table where the students of the cadet court, who had recently returned to the city after the summer locations, were drinking. Oh, shit! Emily whispered. I have a bad feeling about this. I have a bad feeling too, Camille confirmed shifting her gaze from Gloria, who was waving her arms inspirationally at the cadets, who suddenly blew like horses, throwing interested glances at the girls. In a minute, three of them were already heading straight for their corner. 
The young men in the caps looked to be under 18, but they had their heads held high and their stance arrogant. Their leader, a red-haired, broad-shouldered young man, stepped forward, but did not laugh. So you're the Russian. He stood directly in front of me, assessing her with his gaze. Let's say, the girl said reluctantly, barely squeezing the cube, my uncle died in the war. He declared loudly, blaring over the music. Do you think I killed him? I wasn't more than six years old. Camille spoke calmly, leaning back in her chair and looking up at the boy who loomed over her. Well, you have to answer for the sins of your parents. He gritted his teeth, leaning even lower over Camille. Did you hit the girl? Emily asked with feigned apprehension. I'll collect my debt otherwise, said the cadet, and grasping Camille by the round chin, kissed her. The next thing happened so quickly that the entertainer did not even have time to finish his short monologue. Camille jumped up from her chair, her silk dress gently violet-colored for a rustle. The hat flew off her head, revealing a porcelain face and perfect hair. With a swift movement, the petite girl pressed the cadet against the beaten velvet wall. With one hand clutching his throat and the other pressing against his chest, Gloria clapped her hands together in delight. Finally, you were having fun too. But Camille is always so unkind to men. Let him go. Stop it, Paul intervened, putting a wide-brimmed hat over his face. The young man's voice was low and hoarse, the kind that could block out any noise. She let go of the kittens, ended, and his companions looked anxiously at the frail maiden who had so swiftly silenced their friend. It won't go away so easily for you. The lad sat spitefully at the girl and cracked his neck. She's the ambassador's daughter. Rising from his seat, Paul turned to his grandfather. If you want more trouble, then there will be not only kung fu techniques, but also samurai with swords. The cadets paid the price and hurriedly sat down in their seats under the noisy shouts of their comrades. What a marvelous evening. Gloria brought a shot glass. It's a pity the dust has marred the whole cottage again. Would you like to go for a walk? Pro, stealing Camille. So let me pull your ass out. They stood opposite each other, ready to claw at each other. A smile played on Gloria's lips. Camille clenched her teeth tightly. Do you have a problem with guys? I think so. Or are you still terrified of them? I guess you'd never make a real wife. Camille was ready to forget they were in a crowded restaurant and not in a tatami gym. But Paul stepped between them, spreading his hands. I think we'd better pay up and go out quietly. We're already the center of attention. The girls looked around and nodded briefly. Instead of listening to the chanson playing from the stage, all the customers were glued to their dark corner. Even Gloria didn't protest this time. They put the money on the table and were on their way out. A crowd of cadets blocked their way. This time there were twice as many of them. First of all, said one of them, we haven't had any fear of ambassadors for a long time. What a fool, Paul parried, winking at the girls to move toward the door. While the lad was thinking, someone's arm swept across the fields. Someone toppled a table on the cadets, and in a moment the whole foursome was already running for the exit, knocking over waiters' feet and catching the hats of honorable merchants. The car was parked a little farther away. It was necessary to run down the slope. The car was just waiting to slide into its leather seats, and the passengers were rushing toward it with all their might, in spite of their tight dresses and high heels. By now all four of them were laughing. Even enjoyed the laughter, holding up his black hat. Suddenly, the young man ran straight into a patrol in a dark blue uniform with gold trim. The cadets ran out after him, cutting off his escape route. It's all right. Why are the ladies running out of the cafe? The officer asked, looking away from the girls, who suddenly stopped laughing, covering their mouths with their palms. Maybe you forgot to pay, or are these brave fighters the future of the nation? The cadets froze behind, waiting for disaster to befall them. Paul, speak up, elbowing him. You're a gentleman. But Paulus stood with his mouth open, caught on the young officer that, Monsieur, you even took away your tongue. Gloria realized the first sorry, Mr. Officer, 
but my uncle Marcus ordered to bring me home by midnight. Putting her lips in a bow, the blonde held the maid by the sleeve of her uniform and added, and it's 1.15. Mr. Gendarme, you don't want my uncle to be angry with both me and my friends and at the same time with you, do you? The officer cast a fastidious glance at Gloria, then nodded. The gendarmes parted, giving way to the young ladies and the field, who could not come to their senses. Glad to have the police guarding us, the blonde winked, walking past the military. We are not the police, madam. We are gendarmes. Put his hand to his cap officer. I am the staff captain of the gendarmery. My name, but his name was drowned in the rumble of Emily's motor, pressed the klaxon signaling gendarmes we cadet girls waved their hands. Gloria sent a farewell air kiss, and the car rushed away from the noisy Grady Café. She said something to them. Crazy. Turning to Gloria, Camille whispered something to those academics only the truth, sister. I mean, seriously, she was beating them up. Gloria said that the girl at the end table loves guys in uniform, but she can't dare to approach them first. I'll show you some guys in uniform, and a black eye. Almost jumped out of the front seat, Camille. The girls laughed again, remembering all the events of that evening. Their first evening in the dressmaker's shop, only Paul didn't laugh. Paul asked Emily bluntly at the bend. Take the left, replied Paul, gripping the leather seat of the car. Why do you have such a gloomy face? Emily looked at the young man in the rearview mirror, turning onto the boulevard. Okay, already having fun. Even in spite of Gloria's silly shouting, I would ask precisely because of Gloria's silly shouting, came from the back seat. Paul took off his hat, calmed his wavy blonde hair into a bob cut, untied his neckerchief, and looked dreamily around at the distant sickle moon. If you looked, you could realize that melancholy, and Paul is not a guy. Oh, did you recognize that officer? Camille asked. You were just stunned in front of him. That's not like you. Aha, uh -huh. only I answered the girl in a man's suit, keeping her eyes on the sky. Now her voice no longer sounded as low as before. In addition, it was taking on a sad note. I think I was friends with him once, and he didn't seem to recognize you. Gloria put her arm around Polly's shoulders. I guess he's not used to seeing you as a boy, but he thought I was a boy even then. Maybe I've just changed a lot. I was only 12, and he was 17. He was chasing ballerinas and choristers. He's handsome. That's the kind of guy I like. You look at him, and you know he's a hero. The car pulled into the yard of an unassuming gray house near the bazaar. Emily was parking. Camille was humming a French song. By the way, suddenly Paul was talking about Paul again. Guess what his name is? Emily tossed Rick. Christopher. His name is Paul. The girl in the men's suit brought her eyebrows together meaningfully. Slowly, she got out of the car. It was quiet on the outskirts of the city. Here one could hear only candles, Canny's dog wolf and the rustling of hedgehogs in the bushes. Barely had the girls left the car, quietly making their way into the house, when an electric light came on on the first floor of the unassuming estate. Three men stepped out on the threshold. The old chopped up Mr. Stephen, followed by the housekeeper Mrs. Evelyn Poe of a seated woman with soft features and kind eyes, and her son Christopher, a stocky fellow. Was it fun? The host asked mundanely, leaning on a cane, the top of which was carved from ivory and shaped like a lion's head. The girls bought it. Oh, you've already arrived. Snatched up Susan. We were just exploring the city. Gloria started to justify herself. I'm afraid you were conducting a reconnaissance mission. Stephen was as grim as ever. Isn't that why you brought us here for practice? Gloria didn't stop, taking her hands to her sides. Who told you you were still practicing? Grandpa's voice echoed to such a thunderous pitch that a chill ran down the girl's backs. That is, with just her lips, Emily whispered. If we are not in practice, then on our first run. Finished her sentence, Stephen. Is the order to stay quietly at home and not to poke your nose into the street so incomprehensible to you? The girls bent, and the man came close to Gloria's breathing. Have you been drinking a lot? 
Well, now we'll see who drank more. Come, my darlings, to the basement. Alex and I have everything ready for you. The maidens, who a quarter of an hour ago were belligerent Valkyries, looked at each other and silently obeyed the old man. They went down into the cellar on woozy legs and now looked fearfully at the wooden chairs in the corners. Good God, what have you come up with this time? The blonde girl was horrified. Which one of us is first? Gloria, you talk too much. Get your heart over here. It's unseemly to lock a young lady in a basement. The girl with the eye on Christopher. But when has that ever stopped you? Sit down, Christopher's grandfather ordered. And Gloria sat down. Her body was held in place by a leather strap. Stephen, really, this is too much, whispered Camille, stretching the top button of the clothes dress. He only gave her a hard look and ordered her to do it next. In a few minutes, all four were already sitting in corners. Hold their heads. How will Mrs. Evelyn vomit? Stephen turned to the housekeeper, who was watching without a shadow of emotion. I am very angry. Very. But what can you do? I need them all in good health for tomorrow," said and left the cellar, leaving the girls in the company of the silent lady's boyfriend. Winter was for Stephen a time of vacation, which he had arranged for himself. Such vacations he arranged very rarely, because he simply did not know how to track. Under Egyptian palm trees or at least half an hour to sit in a coffee shop. But old age was taking its toll. His joints ached and his head was just about ready to explode from a hundred thoughts, tasks, plans, and algorithms. He was advised to go to the waters or live a few weeks in a Buddhist temple in the Himalayas, but Stephen stubbornly chose the tailor shop. For one thing, it was relatively close to home. He took the train and got up at the station. And secondly, it was rumored that Stephen had a pace here. Of course, no one talked about it in public. And if anyone in the asylum did mention it, it was only as a joke. In general, Stephen was as far from romance as one could imagine. Sokolniki, an old man with silver hair, sideburns mustache, and always clean-shaven chin unusually strict, could have been anything but a lover. That's what teachers and students thought as they saw his sleigh moving down the snowy forest road toward the train station. Stephen instead on the crab started himself a valerian drink with hawthorn and tried to sleep. His head ached terribly, so he was determined not to get into any trouble this time for any money. At least for a week, he would have a miserable seven days to himself. Stephen. The porter opened the doors of the theater box before the gentleman. It is good to see you again, madam. And he bowed low to his companion. The woman blushed thickly and entered the box. Of her it was safe to say plain, middle-aged, of medium height, uncertain, dim, hair color colored from time and tears in her eyes, a few wrinkles on her forehead and in the corners of her eyes. I'm always embarrassed when I'm with you. The woman threw a white shawl over her shoulders, hiding under it a new dress brought from Vienna. When I think about it, you have all the girls in your orphanage lush, kings, young, smart, why do you still come to see me? Stephen, the rental lasted when he was around this supposedly ordinary woman. The words kept getting stuck in his throat. Just say the word and I'll take you to the orphanage. One word from you, Evelyn. I went to the lady's room for a second. The woman interrupted him, rising from her chair. The old man was leaning with both hands on the red velvet banister. He was looking at the crystal chandelier and the golden cubby holes in the decoration of the opera hall. The Capelle Ballet, or as it was called, the blue-eyed beauty, Stephen had seen three times already, but had never yet been to it with Evelyn. He smiled at his light-hearted teenage thoughts. It's true what they say, it's a pain in the ass. A gray hair in the beard. Evelyn had been married ten years ago, when they first met in Porto and now the woman was out of his reach. He could occasionally write letters, passing them through secret exiles, furtively take her hand, visit the dressmakers once a year, and dream of the time when Evelyn would finally leave the bedside of her ex-husband, a petty official of the Southwestern Railroad and owner of several revenue houses. On a waterfall of thoughts, 
Stephen didn't even notice the look on the kid's face as he moved briskly between the rows in the parter. The boy was no more than twelve. He seemed to be well known here, especially by the young nobles and officers. The medics picked his pockets with notes. Stephen satisfied the squint of his eyes was well trained, so he immediately realized to whom those messages were addressed. He realized something else, too. That boy in the green, plaid t-shirt was actually a girl. Yes, she was a real girl. Mrs. Evelyn returned. Soon the performance began. The white tutus of the moth ballerinas were flying into the air. The music was mesmerizing. Evelyn's hand, lying so submissively in his arm, it all seemed to Stephen a miracle, a real vacation, which he undoubtedly deserved. And yet he couldn't get the girl in green out of his mind. Barely through the end of the first act, Stephen went down to the cafeteria. The occasion was very convenient, for every respectable gentleman should treat a lady in the theater with champagne and candy. It was indifferent that with his wealth he could order at least a dozen bottles directly into the box. No sooner had the venerable gentleman got in line than the greenish hue was snatched between the tucked-in tails and satin dresses of the theatricals. Stephen listened. At his age, the ability to listen is dulled. But if you train all six senses for forty years in a row, in particular, intuitively, then in your old age you will begin to notice things you would not want to. I mean, he came here on vacation. He's on vacation. The hell with him. The young lady accepted the ring. Accepted it. So what's the point of getting cocky now? Prima ballerina. Came a muffled voice from behind a heavy velvet curtain. It smears that already not old noblewoman ardently persuaded the boy to arrange a date with the wise waist model and performer of the main part. I'll give her this. Do you hear your name? Livewire, huh? I'll tell my lady I'll be waiting for her after the ballet. You got it, boy. I got it. But you don't understand me. Barely containing his irritation, the boy replied. He answered firmly, without twists and fears. I'm telling you for the third time, the mistress has a migraine today, and she has two more acts to dance with this migraine. Next week, she'll have a cordial lunch with you, write you a contract for another ballet. But not tonight. Do you understand? Not today they'll send for you. Zippy. Above the window in the foyer, and stealthily, so as not to disturb the guests, pulled the sleeve of a tall blonde man in a blue suit, slipped a wrapped paper into his palm. That fear vanished between the men. The blonde man smiled. Is this how ballerinas get their dates? Stephen thought, and stepped a few steps behind the boy, as if he had inadvertently put his cane under his feet. The child stumbled, but kept his balance. Then the gray-haired grandfather, who looked as if he were about to collapse, suddenly grabbed the boy by the scruff of the neck and threw him to the floor. You don't have much of a sniff around here. Or maybe you're picking up honorable people. Let me see your pockets. Well, it's coming out. What do I see in there? A gold watch or a purse? Instantly on his feet, the lively man bowed to Stephen. I'm a messenger, Mr. Messenger. And what are you sending? I can't turn out pockets. I say, sir, it's confidential, confidential and my watch is also confidential. A crowd was gathering around. A blonde man in a suit also approached, stood for a few seconds, but said nothing. Hit me if you want, turn me into the police. But I didn't steal anything, I'm a messenger, and it's not dignified to read other people's letters. May you be a simple laborer, or the prince himself. The fat man replied sharply, shooting his big greenish eyes. All right suddenly softened the old man. If you are a messenger, then arrange a date for me with Mademoiselle Prima. With a respectful gesture, Stephen took the ruby ring off his finger and held it out to the child. But the boy only turned his nose up at mistress. It's not for you. It's not for mistress. It's for you. Do you know how much you can buy with this ring? Did you have a messenger? And he poked me contemptuously. Do you think you can buy everything in the world? What can't? Dignity, sir. The boy picked up a car touch from the floor, waved it, and put it on his head with reverence. The first theater bell rang. 
Looking around the crowd, peering curiously at him, the boy cast one more glance at Stephen, put his hand on his visor in farewell, and disappeared into the maze of theater corridors. Stephen, he laughed, and did not hear someone take him under the elbow. What was it? A pale Mrs. Evelyn was staring at him. Why did you pounce on that child? The man coughed, covering his mouth with his hand. The youthful demons were playing into his, are you the color in their eyes? How can I tell you? In short, I promised not to work for at least a few days. But you see, it's not working. Did you suspect that this mouse is a girl? Surprisingly, Mrs. Evelyn nodded in agreement, keeping Stephen's sad, gray eyes like morning mist. I know this little one. Her name is Camille. She's our daughter, the lodger, you know. Her mother, a former ballerina, got knocked up by a suitor so ardent that he promised her a golden mountain and in the end left her with a child. It's a story as old as the world. Jenna, our tenant, was a child herself. Her parents from Kazakhstan, teachers, both such a quiet, intelligent family of this risk, a word to no one, decided to leave a child, give birth, and bring up. Well, and from the theater she, understandably, thrown out. And what do you want to recruit this girl? She has grown up, sighed the old man. How old is she? Twelve. I knew it. We have a rule we only take in orphans, and not older than ten. There's a second call. Gotta go. I still haven't gotten you any champagne. It's empty, said Evelyn, finally releasing his elbow. You know I think she really is the one you're looking for. You can convince me anything, old man. Mistress Evelyn smiled faintly for the first time all evening. What does your sixth sense say? The woman asked quietly. It has never let you down, has it? Evelyn, I can't just break the rules. Rules that you set up yourself. All right, if you can convince yourself, then come to the address. What did I write? Evelyn handed over a piece of paper torn from her notebook. Isn't this a beer hall? Like a variety show or a cafe? Evelyn nodded, and again a faint smile appeared on her face. And you thought I didn't go to such low-key places? Nah, I'm just in favor of, embarrassed, Stephen. For the first time in a long time, he was truly embarrassed. Evelyn knew as much about him as no other living soul knew. But for the first time in ten years, she felt like his accomplice ally in his spying endeavors. For the first time in a long time a lively light flashed in her eyes. And for the first time, Stephen thought about the fact that from the beginning Evelyn had been interested in being less his mistress than his associate. Well, then the vacation was definitely off. The next day, Stephen sat in a rather decent box at the Variety Theatre. As you walked along and watched Mrs. Evelyn greeting acquaintances in the parter, here at the establishment, there was more chance for a middle-class, married woman to be compromised. But soon Evelyn walked confidently into his box and sat down next to him. I was asked why I was here. And what did you say? Jury prize in the eye. Stephen mirrors out the teenager's ten graying eyebrows. The truth. I'm helping a recruiter find new talent for his theater. And I got a theater. If your young ladies are putting on a show like you did yesterday in the opera lobby, how is that any worse than theater? Her last words were interrupted by loud music. A march was played, and dancers in close-fitting hussar uniforms and shortened skirts appeared on the stage. Barely covering their knees, they were followed by a whole gypsy chorus. Then some painted and knotted all funny clown tried to flirt with the ladies present. There was a python tamer. Two specially invited American dancers threw their legs up in the company of an entertainer with a monkey on his shoulder and held a beauty contest among those present. And the pamphlet The Atheist mocked the shortcomings of bourgeois society. When a large and fashionable lady belted out, oh, I'm a maiden. And it was zero o'clock. You're tough, Stephen. My patience ran out. I've been looking for her all evening. Where's this girl who's causing me so much trouble and mental anguish? Mrs. Evelyn looked at her companion with disapproval. Do you trust me, Stephen? Under that gaze, full of tenderness and a feminine strength he had never seen before, 
the man gave up. He leaned back in his chair and stopped waiting. And at the same moment, a swing suspended from the ceiling came out of the backstage under the thunder of applause. Above it, with one leg tucked under him and the other hanging down, sat a sad Pierrot in a black and white tricot suit. A small tear was drawn on his left cheek. Two faces were cremated behind him. The orchestra played Vivaldi and Pierrot on the swing ended to the beat of the music. Is that her? Breathless, whispered Stephen. It was her, and Tanya could not take her eyes away. The creature seemed to have no bones. The girl easily tumbled on the swing, did somersaults and backflips, reached with her toes. Her every move was weighed to the inch, one miscalculation and lay her mangled on the wooden platform. But she knew what she was doing her gaze clung to the spectators. And Stephen noticed how the story of the unfortunate Pierrot had made more than one young lady in the audience stealthily wipe her eyes. Have you convinced me? That's all Stephen could manage to say, smiling and clapping his hands with the audience. This chick should join our flock. Camille was wiping off her makeup in front of the mirror when her worried mother approached her, still dressed in the shiny corset and short pink pantaloons in which she had danced the last number. Jenna took her daughter by the shoulder. Zippy. There's a gentleman here to speak to us. He says you stole a gold watch from him yesterday. Is that true? Mom, the young one said indignantly, and so loudly that the whole dressing room turned its head. You know I'll never take someone else's, the girl said quietly, biting her lip. This man has come to blackmail her. He wants Camille to set him up with Mrs. Prima. He's so old and gray-haired, and yet he's there. The girl clenched her fists angrily, determined to escape. But in the dressing room already entered the owner of the theater lanky Stepan Olegovich, leading under the arm of the same gray-haired old man. Maybe you have a separate office, affectionately asked the grandfather, putting in the owner's hand a few coins. Bring this one in there, you lively one, and the mommy as well. Who is this child? The clumsy Stepan Olegovich swung at Camille just in time holding back his broad palm. Go together as you are. Go in your makeup and in your native corset. Maybe you'll get some mercy from the Baron for your behavior. It's not for me to teach you. He slapped Jenna on the thighs. On my income, all your bad theater is kept. What a bald teacher. The indignant Jenna took her daughter by a hand and disappeared behind the door to the study. Here kerosene lamps blazed, illuminated by cheap yellowish wallpaper and an unpretentious set, a table, a sofa, and two walnut chairs. I see you're not very welcome at the theater, Stephen said mundanely. Sit down on the fiddler and the sofa. You sit down too. I've heard a good proverb from you. There's no truth in feet. Never understood it until the Dan arthritis got to me. Despite the invitation, mother and daughter stood opposite the old man, not daring to sit down. Camille, in black and white tights with striped makeup and Jenna, studded with sequins with a huge ostrich feather sticking out of her battered mustache of hair in a haphazard manner. Tell me, lively, I'd better address you something else. Camille Camille, old man, slyly tell me, can you read? What's the point of these questions? The mother intervened, stepping forward and covering her daughter. It's because, dear Jenna, I am the founder and honorary guardian of the orphanage. You can call it a school for gifted children. I never went to school, Camille replied confused. I can read, but I can't write very well. I don't think I'm talented. Suddenly she added, and I'm still not going to arrange a date with the lady, unless she wants to. Sit down, the old man interrupted her. Drink some water and prepare yourself for what I'm about to tell you. My name is Stephen. Twenty years ago, I founded the Artemis Orphanage, an intelligent school for girls. We're not some charitable organization. We're a for-profit organization, independent of government, outside of government control. Artemis trains the girls to become top-notch spies, and upon graduation, they sign a 10-year contract. That means I understand what it means, interrupted the old man Jenna. If you take Camille in, I will pray for you until the end of the age. I'm a mom. What are you saying? Mom, 
Jenna knelt down, folding her arms across her chest, and Stephen even had to stand up and lift her to her feet himself and then make her drink two whole glasses of water. Get her, get her away from here. The woman was still chanting. Mommy, why do you wish me right? You see, despite her daughter's protests, Jenna continued to turn to Stephen, grabbing at the hem of his clothes. You see, she is no longer a child, a teenager, almost a girl. She won't be able to pretend to be a boy for long, neither in the opera corridors, nor on the stage. And then what? It's not proper for a decent young lady to curl up like a snake over the stage. The Kaverit stage is so shaky, so unaffected. Circus fame, like a candle, flares and fades. You don't know how to turn from a star to a backyard girl. Camille. After listening to her mother, the old man turned to the girl. Once in Artemis, you will have to forget about your usual life. You will disappear from this Emily without any goodbyes or explanations. Just tomorrow you will be gone, and your mommy will file a missing persons report with the police. Later they'll make a verdict. Missing in action, drowned in the Dnieper, fled to Canada to work. Camille Kakovskaya will disappear forever, just like the lively, like the sad Pierrot. And somewhere far away, many miles away, Another 12-year-old girl will appear under a different name, an orphan adopted by the orphanage Artemis. Will I make it? Camille spoke each word hard, as if they weren't words but fish bones lodged in his throat and blood dividing him from the inside out. To see mom again someday, the rules say you have to sever all ties with your family. But for you, I'll make an exception. You can see your mom, but only after graduation and your first successful assignment. How much time will that take? Camille blurted out impatiently. Who's what? Who gets his first assignment at 16A, who isn't even ready at 20? 18. That I'll get my first assignment. 18. And successfully completed. Jenna burst into tears, dropping to her knees again and hugging her fragile Camille. Mascara was leaking into the early wrinkles on the still very young woman's face, smearing from her daughter's black and white suit. The town clock struck zero o'clock already. Stephen said quietly, taking the hand of Camille, who stood motionless and stone-faced, without a single tear. Mommy, wait for me. Don't be sick. Eat meat at least once a week. Fair. Once in a while, Mrs. Prima. You know she's very unhappy. And don't worry, I'll be back. You're Camille now. Remember that. I already have a Camille. To avoid confusion, you'll be called by different names. Sitting motionless on wooden stools is a very dubious pleasure. The other girls have already thrown up, and they're still tolerating it. Aunt Evelyn, is he going to keep us like this until morning? She finished. I can feel my legs not having legs. There's a mad cockroach bleeding about my head. And you indulge him. You can see Stephen's not himself. The years have taken their toll. Camille, our long acquaintance won't save you. There's no need to resort to pampering. To get rid of the punishment, Evelyn said calmly, settling down on the stool next to her son. A fair one, by the way. Camille, haha. -ha. So that's what Paul used to call you. Gloria laughed. Oh my God, honey, I can't laugh anymore. My stomach hurts. Why the hell did you take the name Paul after your abandoned friend? Camille intervened. And how do you know Mrs. Evelyn? Too many questions. Camille felt it, her head spinning. Stephen, I always knew you wanted me dead. Worthless old man. Ever since the day he accused me of stealing his watch. You should have sewed me up on the spot then instead of torturing me for six years. Stephen, the voice no. Other voices have joined in. Release us, please. We won't do it again. Damn you. Release them, Christopher. Quietly ordered Stephen, peering into the cellar. Gathering at six. That means you, my dears, have less than four o'clock to sleep. You too, Stephen. You too. Barely audible. Camille said, smiling heavily. She held onto the wall with one hand. She was lying on her back, watching a bug crawl over both of them. 
The candle flame flickered in the gusts of fresh breeze to the sigh outside, making the stuffiness of the August night less unbearable. Gloria, sharing the room with her, was still fiddling with the mirror. Her thin nightgown, adorned with expensive lace, had slipped off concealing freckles and forearm-long thick hair scattered behind her back. Why did you come back? Gloria tossed over her shoulder, noticing Camille's gaze in the mirror. That from the bud had shifted to her. You want to tell me how you know Evelyn? She put her hands under her head and stared dreamily through the ceiling, her gaze piercing the roof, instantly transcending space and time. I was eight when my mother got me into the opera house. She was a former ballerina, had connections among the dancers. She was friends with the sixth dancer in the third row. He chuckled. Yes, the sixth dancer in the third row, rising to prima donna. And how else? I'm not going to be told anything at all. I forgot that you have no sense of humor, shook her legs, Gloria. I'm not talking. I'm not talking. Too eager to hear about the youth of a handsome officer. That's how they got you into the theater as an errand boy, exiled between ardent admirers and their families. Let me guess with Gloria's squint. And Monsieur Paul at the time was a lively so left critic, madly in love with the prima ballerina. A slight smile flashed across his face. No, he was not in love with Prima. He was in love with a red-haired dancer, with a new girl from the Corps de Ballet, then again with some Christ. Gendarmerie Captain Hall has a big heart. Gloria twirled a strand of golden hair on her finger. But you were laying down for a sophisticated person like you. An ordinary womanizing boy wouldn't have been worth a blank slate. Am I wrong? One day I came to the theater before the morning rehearsal. My eyes, they were distant again, dreamy. It was Sunday. The deserted city seemed mysterious and sad. Even the janitors who sweep or fall in maple leaves every morning were nowhere to be seen. At the front door of the theater, with his back resting on a marble slab and hiding from the rain, sat a cadet in a white uniform with red epaulets. He was writing something in a notebook, all to the side. I looked over his shoulder. You know, I was expecting to see a corny love letter or teenage pathos. Love your eyes. Kiss your hands. What was that? Gloria was fighting sleep. Her curiosity was still winning. Fatigue. Everyone has their own paradise to the point of exhaustion. Everyone has their own dream. Who could still sleep off the delirium of dreams? Worried heart, weeping with excitement, unheard at night on the heart of Sergut. With what have you climbed to the seal? Bravo, bravo, Monsieur Paul. Clapped his hands, Gloria, finally set the candle, and dived under the sheet next to the girl. Who knew you were so romantic? Shut up. Camille rudely cut her off, moving to her side of the bed and pulling the sheet over. Gloria laughed some more, but soon her breathing was quiet and even. Outside the window it was light, the morning roosters crowed loudly in the yards, and tits began to crow in the trees. When Camille finally dozed off, she dreamed of her childhood. A cranky pranga ballerina with her mood swings, broken vases, screams, tears, and crude station house profanity. Dreaming of hours of grueling variety show training, the drunken sensation of the stage, and hundreds of eyes piercing into you, waiting to see if a bird would fly up or shatter everything like an expensive Chinese mistress face. You dream of the piercing, sharp hunger with which you go to bed and wake up knowing that the next performance is a week away and there's no money for bread. And then there's the russet-haired kid that tells you all the secrets, thoughts, dreams, and love affairs. He can talk, and you can listen so you know everything about him. And he knows nothing about you, and he doesn't even suspect that you are a girl in short pants and a green jacket who races through the corridors of such a majestic and unattainable, decorated with new velvet and gold theater. And then there was nothing. Only snow-covered spruce forests and mountains covered with snow caps. On that winter day, the sun shone so strongly. Did it hurt your eyes? Stephen put the round glass of his sunglasses on his nose, and all that was left was to move his cap harder and tangle himself in the gray terrycloth scarf 
he had bought at the station from a street vendor. The farther they drove away from the house, the harder the girl's heart pounded. And when their sleigh pulled up to the big treacherous gate, which obviously served as the only entrance and exit to the impregnable walled fortress, she generally almost jumped out of her chest. While the travelers waited for someone to open the deadbolt, the girl looked around, trying to get a grip on herself. What does it say? She turned to Stephen, pointing to an inconspicuous plaque above the gate with an inscription she couldn't read. It says the name of our orphanage in German Artemis. The man nodded and began to explain. There was such an ancient Greek goddess of the woman driver, hunter, owner of the moon. We are in Germany. Camille interrupted at half a word, looking at him with big intelligent eyes. We are in Galicia. These lands are now under the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I see. She answered briefly and tangled herself tighter in her scarf. That's all you want to ask. You haven't said a word all the way here. I have six years to learn everything I want to know, said like a girl cut off. And Stephen whistled. The decision to bring very young orphans to the orphanage was no mere whim. The little children, knowing no other Emily and having no relatives outside the wall, perceived Artemis as a single family, a single authority, and a single truth. The old man scratched his clean-shaven face and chin and sighed. His Camille was an experiment that could undo all twenty years of hard work, or maybe, on the contrary, become a breath of fresh air, an example to the perverted. Artemis. While Stephen pondered, the gates opened, horses charged, and the sleigh leisurely drove into the territory of a luxurious estate with marble statues and fancy gazebos, ice slides, and skating rinks where little girls under the supervision of a nanny were added. In the distance there was a greenhouse, behind the glass walls of which the stiff-eyed passers by were grown-up girls. The children rushed towards us with joyful shouts that the coachman had to hold the horses. Stephen, Stephen is back. You're early, aren't you? The gorgeous lady in a fluffy coat the color of snow came up to the soldier. I see the vacation has come to an end, she added, glancing at Camille. Stephen, what are you doing? Has the boy been brought to us with blood? Covered freckles, nose, brown eyes. A girl in a short, colorful coat. No, Gloria, you're wrong. It's not a boy. Take a closer look. Gloria bent her head well, like a long neck, and goose gazing at an obscure stranger, a packed path. From that look, Camille was going down. Stephen, you said that only pretty girls are taken to Artemis, because spies must necessarily be pretty. This one is, honestly, not very pretty. At the pout of her lips, the blonde held her tongue. Lori raised her voice at her, the woman in the white coat, and Stephen stopped her with a wave of his hand. More and more of the small female residents of the orphanage converge, eyeing the new arrivals with interest. You know, my dear Gloria, during these few days I manage, I suddenly realize that we need not only beautiful, but also gray and unremarkable Artemis, who can disappear in the crowd, whom everyone in the city will see every day, and then will not even remember the face. Stephen's eyes, so calm and deep, slid over each of the girls until they stopped on the blonde again. So you're making a mistake. Beauty comes in many forms. Take a closer look at Laura, and until we do, don't jump to conclusions, Stephen signaled the coachman, and the sleigh drove on, all the way to the Grand Palace. It is made of white brick, faced with colorful tiles with a spire, wooden balconies, galleries, and a large clock on the central tower. This is your new home, addressed Camille affectionately by Mr. Frau Wendy. The housekeeper called out to him, Be kind, prepare a room for the new girl, give her linen, school uniform, and feed her. What am I telling you? You know everything yourself. The dark-haired Frau Wendy, quite young for her position, smiled back. She's so mature. She poked Edic's tongue into my little hedgehog. It will not be easy for you among our pet snake carcasses. Let's go, my orphan. I'm not an orphan. Camille cut me off, flashing her greenish things. I have a mother. Mrs. Wendy, 
only surprised at Stephen. And the latter nodded. What should I call you? Have you already thought of a new name? I have. Not for bags with the answer, said Camille, taking off a sharp car touch from the swifts on his head. Paul, I'll be called Paul from now on. The housekeeper coughed, hiding a smile behind that cough. Having corrected her apron and slave-length hollow skirt at the edges of her crimson, Frau Wendy gave the girl a gentle nudge in the back, and together they entered the spacious hall of a building that looked simultaneously like both a forest hut and a royal palace. Even for the regulars of the opera, this house seemed amazing. Seemingly unreadable things were harmoniously combined here. Camille raised her head, looking at the large chandelier of greenish crystal, trying hard not to show surprise. The girl didn't notice the snow falling from her shabby scrolls under the standing snow, leaving puddles, and her obscurely colored boots to two sizes larger spreading muddy water all over the front hall. The front door creaked loudly behind her, and a flock of teenage girls flew in from outside. Camille was able to get a better look at them now. They were really all beautiful, and they were all dressed up like young ladies, all with their pretty hats, their little jokes, and their warm gloves with bows on the cash register. If Camille could draw, she would have painted a portrait of each of them. Girls, get acquainted. Mrs. Wendy addressed them affectionately. This is Paul Paul. Way in, they bent. Isn't that a man's name? And how old are you, Paul? Stepped forward Gloria, looking defiantly straight into Camille's eyes. Twelve, she answered, holding her gaze. And I'm twelve. How long have you been trained? Trained. Well, you know how the agency trains first in the field and then brings you to the orphanage. They started training me when I was five and brought me here when I was seven and a half. I wasn't trained. Look, she wasn't even trained. Gloria looked around at the other girls. Tell me you have parents and I have a mom. Camille raised her chin proudly. Mom, everyone exclaimed. Artemis came closer and closer, the circle closed, and it seemed to me that even the housekeeper became awkward. Girl, pushing Gloria away, the unearthly maiden came close. Do you even realize where you're going? This is an orphanage. No one here has moms or dads or even great aunts. And if you're so special, you should go back to your mommy instead of bragging to us. Frau Wendy couldn't stand it and stared. Her cheeks were as red as grated. Beats. If she was here, there must be a reason. Stephen wouldn't bring the new Artemis just for no reason. What do you think? She's so gifted. Gloria flared up. I speak seven languages, four of them without an accent, knocking out eight out of ten targets with a revolver. I know geography and history at the level of university students and me. I know life abruptly punctuated her speech. Camille. While you grew up and blossomed here as a type of nickname, I struggled every day to survive. So cut me some slack and don't ever speak to me again. All of you. She turned around to the rest of the girls. Y'all don't ever talk to me again, she said and ran up the stairs. Mrs. Wendy only shook her head disapprovingly, looking at the young Artemis with disapproval and picked up the hem of her long skirt and headed after Camille. Don't take it personally. They're not mean, they're just too stupid. Mrs. Wendy switched to Russian, catching up with the new girl. You're from the dressmaker to the chicken, aren't you? Camille nodded. They climbed the wooden stairs, creaking with every step. Bright multicolored light streamed in from the stained glass windows, casting sun bunnies on fallen cheeks. Girls, you eat some sleep and then meet Vanessa in the evening. She introduces you to the local customs. Draw up a training program with you. Stairs and then there's the second floor, third floor. We have 32 girls living here, trying to cheer Camille up. Next is the young housekeeper, occasionally adjusting her handkerchief. Oh, we miscalculated. 33. Each has a personal training plan and specialization. Marietta, for example, is immersed in history and international law. Emily and Sarah work with technology. Lakshmi is best at martial arts. Three things to do. Next up is Mrs. Wendy. 
She was unstoppable now. We also have prodigies like Gloria and Camille, who you just met. Their minds work many times faster than other people's. Oh, fifth floor. There are only free rooms here. The housekeeper opened the doors, and Camille found herself in a small room clean and bright, nestled just under the roof. In the corner stood a table decorated with a net napkin. Next to it was a desk, a closet, a dressing table with an electric lamp, and just in case, a kerosene lamp. Everything was small, teenage, just enough to fit. And in the middle was a bed, over which a roof with a huge window overhung. In that window was a blue winter sky. Having such a sky above their heads, they were willing to bitch about anything. In the evening, she would see the sun off over the mountains, and at night, the moon would shine on her. The same month as her mother's, the same as Mrs. Primates, and certainly the same as Paul's, who would never know where the lively boy, the messenger, the prima ballerina, and his missing friend had gone. Camille sank helplessly on the bed and stared off into the distance. After standing in the doorway for a little while, the housekeeper sighed and walked out, leaving the new girl alone with her sorrowful ones. Mademoiselle Vanessa paced the room on the mountain night had fallen. Out of the blue, the wind came up and conquered the windows. Vanessa took it as a bad omen. She even thought she could hear wolves howling in that bucket. She wasn't afraid of anything in this world, not of spiders, not of the dark, not of death, which had already looked in her eyes a hundred times. But wolves, for some reason, made her afraid, probably since her grandmother first told her about ghouls. Mademoiselle Vanessa was afraid of everything that could not be explained rationally by the laws of physics. For example, there was no way she could explain why Stephen had brought this 12-year-old girl who wasn't even an orphan. What does he think he's doing, that crazy old man? He's been a weirdo all his life, but he's gone completely insane. Now he pretends to have a headache, so he sleeps in his room. Mademoiselle Vanessa snatched her white fox coat from the chair and threw it on angrily. A strand of hair dislodged from beneath her masterfully arranged gilded hairpin, flew out of her eyes, hit the floor. Mistress, the housekeeper knocked on the door, peering into the study. I've brought the new girl. Just get her started. Mademoiselle bellowed, sipping a white lace wall. I can't stand it. She's guessing. The old grandfather will never tell us what he's thinking. He always wants us to look at his charades. And she was not standing in front of Mademoiselle Vanessa, eyes downcast and timidly clutching her new grassy green skirts. She was looking at her own reflection in the glass of the sideboard and was even more indignant. Apparently Camille was uncomfortable in her Artemis school uniform. So tell me. Vanessa sat down on the table in front of her, putting her leg over her foot. This was the same woman who had first greeted the new arrivals. The same gorgeous lady with flashing eyes lined with black arrows, a pointed nose, and a swan neck that revealed the deep neckline of a velvet dress. What is there to tell? The girl looked up at her, shifting from foot to foot. Is your collar too tight for you? Or were there no shoes in your size? And what's the matter with your hair? It's just awful. Don't bite your lip, ma'am. My name is Miss Vanessa. I am the headmistress of the school and Stephen's right hand here at the orphanage. The girl glanced incredulously at the woman, Mademoiselle Vanessa. Pardon my impertinence, but you are no more than 25 years old. You are. And you are indeed impertinent and straightforward. The headmistress moved to the edge of her seat. There's plenty of chair. Not every girl who comes into my office can speak so freely. But I'll answer you. I'm 32 years old. I was the first of Artemis and now have the honor of leading the school. I saved a queen from an assassination attempt, stopped a military conflict in Africa, and saved a relic of an important dynasty. What about you? What about you? I'm 12. For over three years, I pretended to be a boy to earn money and get out of debt. And I wore boyish clothes. So this is the marketplace. Skirt stockings, anything that doesn't squeeze and slip down. I'd gladly trade it all in for a comfortable pair of pants and a tight shirt. Wear whatever you want on your day off. 
and please come to class in uniform. It's people like you we make ladies out of. I hope your hair is growing fast, or you'll have nowhere to put a bow. And they were about to give birth to the mouth, but Mademoiselle Vanessa interrupted her with an appropriate gesture. You don't speak English, do you? No, ma'am. So what hole did they pull you out of? Can't you at least speak German and French? I know some French words. My friend is French on my mother's side. He often inserts phrases, words, phrases. Vanessa's grabbing her head. Tell me honestly, for what talent and special merits Stephen brought you here? And did not tread on the spot. Her cheeks reddened and her hands clutched harder at her skirt. Maybe because I can dance. The girl said hesitantly. Dance? That made me laugh. All right, you'll have a dance. Four o'clock in the ballroom. By then, Mademoiselle Vanessa began to write quickly with an automatic pen. Can you even read? I'll give you a routine of seven o'clock outside, then breakfast. Geography with the youngest. Individual French with Madame Denise. Writing, horse care, lunch. Then English, seven years, science. And then you're dancing. Can you hold it or can you run away? I will hold out. Mademoiselle Vanessa bowed her head in a bow Camille. May I kiss your hand? Vanessa could see the new girl's fingers trembling, her shoulders settling with hers. She could feel how much the girl wanted to turn around and run for her eyes away from this place, despite the blizzard and the silly night. She smiled predatorily and put her hand up for a kiss, not a kiss. Calm, measured, submissive. Madame Headmistress sighed faintly. She knew such girls well, born penniless. The only treasure they had was pride. Not the deadly sin of pride, but precisely pride. A steel rod, secure on earth and swiftly reduced to the sky, not allowing them to break. She knew because she was like that herself. Perhaps that was why Stephen had dragged her, this unlucky girl, to the ridiculous nickname. Paul is still chuckling quietly himself now, rereading Ivanhoe or the Divine Comedy for the 100th time. I can't stand that old man for life. I'm out of. Pro, grumbled Vanessa to herself under her breath. Almost left her office. In the morning, there were snowdrifts on the chalk. With difficulty, the front door was ajar, so Artemis, sleepily issuing from the stairs in his jokes and fluffy hats, Immediately shovels were handed out and orders were given to clear the road. Not a bad job for the worn out ladies. They reluctantly accepted the shovels and went into the streets to shovel snow. Camille's gray scroll and flowery green cartouch stood out among the bright and variegated colors. On her, the mirror, they whispered. Camille grasped the shovel's handle and concentrated on the job at hand. Pick it up and throw it away. Pick it up and throw it away. Is this what she would do? Follow orders and keep a low profile. Six years should only last six years. A snowball flew straight at her head, knocking off her car touch. The cold snow hit her by the scruff of her neck and began to melt quickly on her hot back. Who did that? Exclaimed backup Kleitnikov, keeping an eye on the girls no one admitted. Artemis only laughed, covering themselves with their sleeves. Who did it? I ask you. He said it again. Don't take it so hard. Gloria spoke in a honeyed voice, her lips folded in a bow. We're children. I don't care which one of us did it. I'm sure she just spilled it, kindly, childishly. Kind Sam coughed and melted, not a hum, and went back to work, right before the breakfast bell rang. Another snowball flew into Artemis' ear now. It was aimed and hard. Mrs. Agniska, the geography teacher, stood between the pupils and twirled a globe in confusion. She was plump. Her voice was high and now very excited. We are giving lessons in French. How are we to be? The five girls are a few years younger, and they, in the same white shirts and green aprons, watered at her in surprise, as if finding no answer. How could one not know French at such an honorable age of twelve? The private lesson in a separate room wasn't so bad, but riding in the indoor stadium turned into another challenge. 
especially when one of the older girls let her horse gallop. And if it weren't for her gymnastic skills, Camille would have been out of the saddle long ago. Finally, the tower struck four. Camille had found the dance hall. It seemed to her that the ballet room of the theater where she had spent so much time was not as luxurious as the schoolroom. Camille could barely keep up with the teacher. Her body, accustomed to the strict rules of ballet and aerial gymnastics, was completely confused when she had to do a new and incomprehensible movement. It felt numb, and her head stopped memorizing the combinations, intentionally or accidentally, but Mrs. Vanessa entered the hall. As always, gorgeous, with a fake dress under her throat and black gloves up to her elbows, the class had stopped. I didn't mean to disturb you. The girl had just dropped in for a glimpse of the world-famous dancer Paul, but I'm still not impressed with her. Do you at least dance the waltz? Or politics? I don't know how. Sinking my eyes. Camille, realizing she stumped herself. You can't. So why did Stephen take you to school for dancing? Why don't you go and ask him? Like a hurt puppy? Camille asked. I'd ask him, the principal said, but he hasn't left his room all day, citing a toothache. So Camille didn't understand. You mean he left you to my troubles and disappeared without a word? Go on with your lessons. Mrs. Vanessa waved her hand and quickly left the room. The furious stomping of her heels rang through the hallway. The class continued, but Camille couldn't get Vanessa's words out of her head. Of course, no one but Stephen would know how she had miraculously ended up here. How she had earned it. Did everything around her suggest that she did not belong here? At dinner, Camille powerlessly picked at her plate in this crowded and noisy room. Camille felt as lonely as she had ever felt in her life. I wish I could disappear, fall into the ground right here and now. No more Stephen headaches. She would run away home a star, shoot on the stage of a cafe while lurking in the dressing room of a prima ballerina until night listening to stories of the field and fall asleep to her mother's lullaby. But they won't run away. She won't. She promised. And only when she was in her room, alone with the full moon peeking through her big window, the strong Camille under her new name, Hall stopped holding back her tears pouring pink on her down pillows. Time stretched as slowly as one could imagine. Every day Camille forced herself to get out of bed, to brush her hair, which was slowly falling away from the steel but still sticking out, to put on a white blouse under her throat, an uncomfortable skirt, new languages Emily B's or in your head. English and French words flew in and out without lingering, and German words passed by. All the sciences were simple and easy to understand. Mathematics seemed to be Chinese literacy. Spring watered the snow little by little. Already Stephen had returned from wherever he was, and you could never tell for sure where he was telling the truth, where he was being sly, and where he was just joking. The kids, with whom Camille had most of her lessons, also shunned her. Considering her a rod, and not knowing elementary things, but the peers preferred to avoid the new girl altogether. That day, walking outside after school and noticing the stand of peers around the garden table, she was about to turn onto another path out of habit. But right in front of her, almost knocking her down, ran Gloria in her colorful coats with her face red with anger. The five Artemis sitting at the table were just drawing sketches of dresses. They were going to order them for themselves from an Odessa woman who was about to arrive. Gloria flew up to the girls, snatched the paper, and threw it right into the dirt. What's she doing? Shouted the older Camille, Gloria's girlfriend, puffing up her cheeks. Did he bite you? Or have you been like this since you were a kid? Slapped the prostitute's daughter, blurted out Gloria, beaming even more. I didn't expect anything nice from you, but meanness. What did you say about me? Only the truth slammed her eyelashes Camille making a look of innocence, which made her already large, luxurious eyes seem even bigger. I told you that you've been skipping half your classes because you think you're too smart for them. I also told her you've been seeing the stable boy, and he's been visiting us a lot. Fresh hay almost every day, he brings honey gingerbread. Camille rolled her eyes, 
smiling dreamily and showing everyone her straight white teeth. The girls at the table laughed. A moment later, Gloria's doll was already flying in the direction of Camille's little face. The girl turned around, placing a footstool. Gloria fell to the ground wet with snow, but managed to catch her rival's neck with her hand. Another second, and both girls were already climbing on the cold ground, bruising each other with mud and blood from the gas glove. She stood there with her mouth agape, watching the girls. Emily and Camille's other friends jumped up from their seats, but did not dare to get into the fight either. Only when Sam came out on the doorstep with a broomstick and whipped both maidens with the birch twig with a swing, did they finally part on two sides licking their battered lips and on the first spring grass of blood. This incident made Camilla think. It used to seem to her that all these little flowering houseplants lived in their own perfect world, without pity or care, without the ghosts of the past. She was locked in her own grief and didn't even think about the fact that each of the girls in the orphanage had their own tragedy hidden behind a brightly colored coat. So, pondering, she was going to the floor of the central tower where the chapel was located near the clockwork. It was a place she had found by accident, exploring the estate. Many times, Camille had come here, hiding from the noise. It was always empty. But this time there was a girl sitting in the middle of the temple, a complete stranger to Camille. She put her head covered with a shawl on her knees, her hand stretched out prayerfully in front of her. She was about to go backwards, but half of the wooden floor creaked and the praying people were startled by the unexpected sound. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. She said, no, it's okay. The girl smiled back at her. I'm Nancy and you're Paul, said Camille embarrassedly, leaning against the wall. I haven't seen you at school before, but you're in our uniform. You're the new girl. Nancy laughed. Are you kidding? I'm 20 years old, I'm pretty much an old lady, just been in practice for the last few months. Squatting. What are you standing there for? She timidly walked over and sat down on the mat next to Nancy. You know, I was living in London, where the poor live. They put me on a nursing course and sent me all sorts of little jobs from time to time. Real training assignments, Nancy sighed. And I failed miserably on the last one. I guess I'm the oldest Artemis here now. And what was that assignment you failed at? The voices glowed with fire, and she felt hot. Had she too? Camille will take exams until she is very old and never be able to become either a real Artemis or a real agent. It's even funny to think back. I was supposed to get a job as a dancer at the local Kaverit. They were hiring everyone, and they turned me down. But why? Camille shrugged. Her companion looked at her with brown eyes as clear as amber, with a fire in them. No technique. No artistry. My judges have given their verdict. I thought they'd take me at least for my pretty face. But you see, I've lived my whole life here in the orphanage. I've learned to be the center of attention. From countess to maid, I can play the part and shoot a man without hesitation. It's proven. But when I'm on stage, the real stage. I lose control of myself in an instant. I don't know what to do. Have you talked to Stephen about this? Of course I have. Doesn't he realize that this kind of task isn't for you? Why can't he give you something else? Nancy laughed, and there were attractive dimples in her cheeks. There won't be anything else. Stephen has made it clear to me that, until I overcome my stage fright, my personal demon, he won't allow me on a real mission. That's cruel. Camille came out. Stephen is pretty cruel in general. Nancy smiled sadly. But maybe that's why he runs the best intelligence network in Russia. Would you like to? Camille suddenly looked up at her new acquaintance and said, I'll teach you not to be afraid of the stage. Who the hell are you, Nancy? I'm new. The girl proudly stuck up her nose. My name is Paul. I'm 12 years old and I grew up in a costume box backstage at the cafe. Trust me, you're a strange girl. Paul noticed Nancy leaning back, I leaning on my elbows. You know, Artemis love to talk about themselves, but hate to listen. And they also hate helping, because everyone wants to be first in the course. 
I guess that's why. I've never been here. Camille said, You may not live, but everyone will have to get along with you. You'll see, winked Nancy. Well, when's the first class? Even now, the ballroom is empty in the evenings. We'll start with classical choreography. The basics. The shortcut to the ballroom was through the kitchen. The girls decided to bend quietly, so that the cook did not accidentally notice and did not scold. Hastily entering the hall, took off their shoes, and turned on the gramophone. The orchestra played a wounded favorite Vivaldi. Well, to the loom. I gave the command. The youngest and the eldest, after listening to six, straightened up and easily put a fragile, almost transparent hand on the bar. Yes, spring was playing. Summer had begun, followed by the sound of fall. Pulling Nancy's toe one last time and wrapping her heel painfully inside, Camille gave a new command. Now we're going to improvise. With a nod, the girl pointed to the center of the hall. I'm not sure I can do this. How about you show me and I'll do it again? No, dear Nancy, that won't do. Do you hear the music? It's autumn. Imagine you've become a maple leaf, twirling, falling from the tree. Camille said, and Nancy really did think she was a fallen leaf. And even every movement was measured, deliberate, naturally. The girls were twirling in a dance they knew only to themselves, unaware that curious eyes were watching them from behind the ajar door. Nancy only noticed the fluffy sleeve of a white fox coat flickering through the crack. Little by little the surrounding mountains were shedding their snowcaps, sheltering themselves with greenery. Birds were pouring over the rubble. They wanted to leap over the fence and run far, far away, where legend says the enchanted lake is located. She didn't count the bruises from sparring in kung fu and horseback riding, either she was no longer able to distinguish between languages, and finally mastered the basics of belly dancing, learned polka, mazurka, waltz. A science teacher once told me about the force of inertia. Well, she lived by inertia. What are you dreaming about? Nancy came and sat next to me on a swing hidden in the back of the garden. They'd long ago fallen in love with this steamy swing and had evening gatherings here. I have good news. I'm sailing to Quebec in a week. There's a cabaret there with an underground casino that already employs one of our Artemis. If they take me on as a dancer, Stephen has promised to let me on my first real mission. I'm glad. Camille grabbed her hand, smiling. It was a sad smile, though. Next to Nancy. Life at the orphanage didn't seem so bleak, and now she'll be gone too. Have you started on the room yet? I was hoping you could help me, she said cheerfully. It's so strange to dance for yourself and forget about the audience. Here we've always been taught to live for show, to attract attention. It's so strange not to be real. And no, swaying over the ocean in your head. It all depends on the point of view. Here's the sky, for example. Nancy pointed to the pink glow. It's blue, isn't it? Why does it pretend to be beaver, yellow, regimental in the evening, and then become black and wane stars at night? From a physics standpoint, the sky has no color, nothing has color at all. It's just the wavelengths of light waves that change. It's only in our eyes. That's what I'm talking about. It all depends on the angle of view. Anyway, I got something here. Do you know tarot cards? No, I shook my head no. V. Golanishev. The tall boot. Nancy had a secret pocket. There she usually kept a small but sharply sharpened knife. You never know what a plotting knife will come in handy for, she used to say. Now a miniature deck of cards sat next door to the knife. These are unusual playing cards. They can tell fortunes, Nancy whispered ominously. Maybe you'd rather be a fortune teller and get a job in a cabaret. Think about it. You'd have no shortage of customers, shadows and beauty. Nancy whispered without changing her tone. Wow, here come the lucky whistlers. Nancy, based on the fortune teller's role, is the ancient Roman goddess of luck. Fortune. She is fickle and may not always turn her back on a poor man, but may stomp the emperor himself into the mud. She doesn't care who stands before her. She is blind. 
And today, my dear fortune has returned to you. What's that supposed to mean? Murmured this hourly nose, I'm going to win the estate cards and go to live by the sea. It means you'll have your chance not to miss it. Changed to a whisper again, spun the card in his hands. Camille only shrugged her shoulders. She wanted to call her friend inside already, but she saw something scary. One of the towers of their stately home and disappeared like a Christmas firework. The map fell out of her hand. What happened? Nancy exclaimed anxiously. But Camille was already running into the yard, gazing into the fire. It seemed to her that the towers to the left of her favorite watchtower were engulfed in flames. Was someone there? The maids were already running out of the house. The old key apprentice was running for the fire hose, the stableman and fiddling at the water stand, unscrewing fuses. I'm here. Save me. I'm here. Barely audible. And the voice came from the top of the tower, whose wooden floors threatened to collapse. Mademoiselle Vanessa ran out into the street in the very robe over her underwear. Her house was burning. Her school was burning. A school designed from children's drawings of the very first Artemis, with three tall guardhouses and wooden galleries and balconies. But the terrible thing was different in the flaming tower that housed the library. Screamed her tutor, I can't get down, there's fire everywhere, she exclaimed. Help, help, it's Zoya, one of the seven-year-olds. In horror whispered someone behind Vanessa's back. The housekeeper Wendy pressed the panic button and the girls ran outside in droves, jumping into their shoes and wrapping themselves in diapers. Only one whispered inside, pushing her way through the crowd. Stop, where are you going? Vanessa shouted after the green shadow, but it was already tapping its heels on the stairs of the central clock tower. And Nina drive the crazy one away, ordered one of the older girls, the director, watching the ladder being pulled out of her waistband, examining the hydraulic arm. It seemed to her, a former Artemis agent, that it was all being done very slowly and very carelessly. She was just about ready to run into the burning tower herself when the very same shadow appeared from the window of the center guard just in front of the dial. Oh God! Vanessa clutched her head, noticing Strision of Artemis. She had heard her shouted at more than once, Ah well tear, Bibigan. She cast a glance back at Mrs. Vanessa then at the tower engulfed in flames, and without hesitation went on the ledge, leaping swiftly to the wooden balcony connected to the library. So what now? How did you get downstairs? Thunder would have carried you. Smoke obscured the top of the tower. I couldn't see very well. The equestrians set up a ladder to climb the steps, but Nancy was ahead of them, kicking the ball forward. She climbed up herself, holding the end of the hydraulic hose in her hand. Still, the ladder was short Watto, and there was no way to reach the top of the tower. Suddenly, from the top of the tower, tied with a rope, under the chest began to descend Zoya. She stood on the balcony and threw the rope over a metal bar. Like a lever, slowly lowered the seven-year-old down. I've got her, shouted Nancy, and without thinking long, cut the rope with a knife, taking it out of the shin of her boot. She placed the trembling Zoya on the stairs and handed her to the men below, running down there, turning on the water. But there was no turning back the long wooden ones. The balcony was already starting to collapse. Heard them wrong, grabbing air with their mouths, went down the rope. With all her might, Mademoiselle Vanessa shouted, If you don't make it, I'll kill you myself. She nodded to that, tethering a stump of rope. She began to descend. Catching her breath, Artemis watched the action as suddenly the rope burst and dust flew down from the height of the fourth floor. Vanessa felt like closing her eyes. For the first time in her life, she was numb with terror. Her eyes remained open. The field fell, fell right onto a cart of hay that had unknowingly come from under the balcony. Mrs. Vanessa looked around and saw Gloria, Camille Sr. and Mara from walking away from the cart pretending it was God knows whose merit at all. The towers were still blazing for a long time. The fire was put out, but the library could not be saved. And though Camille did not like to read very much, she felt sorry for the beautiful library. She was lying on a bed in the hospital, 
dreaming of falling asleep and forgetting. But she couldn't because of the pain. Her skin was very hot, and her throat was scratchy from the smoke she had swallowed. Long-bearded, the paramedic, whom Camille for some reason before beware, turned out to be a friendly uncle with an excellent sense of humor. Fortunately, the burns are not serious. There won't even be a scar, or would you like to keep a few to commemorate your exploits? You name it, anywhere on your cheek, on your shoulder blades. We'll make you some nice scars. He winked, shaking the scalpel in the air. It's not funny at all. Mademoiselle Vanessa stated coldly, walking into the hospital room and giving the doctor a look that would make him never want to joke again. Leave it, Mademoiselle Vanessa, Camille retorted. He's just amusing me. He says he needs your permission to inject me with morphine. At the word morphine, the director lowered herself, but nodded approvingly. Just a small dose, just to help you sleep. Pain is hardening. Did you have a problem with morphine? Camille asked bluntly, smiling faintly. Just because you became a heroine today doesn't give you the right to ask me provocative questions. She said as if she had cut me off. The woman sits down on the edge of the bed. When Stephen comes back, he'll think of a punishment for your disobedience. The order was to leave the room, and I was hiding from the injection. Camille, how's Zoya feeling? The director nodded at the neighboring bed, on which the seven-year-old was sleeping peacefully. I had no trouble sleeping at her age either, Camille muttered, trying to burrow deeper under the covers. The paramedic laughed, and even Mistress Vanessa couldn't contain her smile. I think I'm beginning to understand why that old man drew you to us. The headmistress muttered, biting her lip. You know our Stephen is rarely wrong. Mademoiselle Vanessa nodded approvingly. Well, get well, Artemis, she said, rising. And when you've recovered, come and see me for tea. Must discuss some changes in your program. The mother tongue is canceled. Camille whispered hopefully. No, by no means. But classical choreography is being added. Tell me, can you teach the girls the basics of ballet? If they had announced that she had become Queen of England or won a month's ticket, the girl would hardly have been more pleased. Mademoiselle Vanessa, may I kiss your hand? No's voice trembled and broke off. No sooner had Camille returned to class, still bound in several places with bandages. Forbidden to exercise for a whole month, she realized her world had turned upside down. Not 180 degrees, but at least 90 degrees. Hi, Paul. How are you feeling? While you were sick, we were studying time zones. Do you want me to explain the prime meridian in Greenwich? The younger ones were spinning around her like a net. And Wirt is a lefty and a fidgety, lefty seven-year-old. Zoya called her sister's field at all. Oh, and the teachers were suddenly showing more respect for the new girl. Only Gloria sarcastically threw during the meeting winks, how do you like Morphin? Are you still using? She took no offense. After all she'd been through, that was the slightest of evils. In the dining room, she encountered a calm and poised Mara and smiled welcomingly. That day Artemis had no idea where all four of them would be led by an act so spontaneous, intuitive, and truly heroic. After all, they were the ones who had saved the unfortunate Camille and had managed to hitch the cart with hay just in time. The sun was setting behind the mountains. She sat on the swing, watching the workers finish their work. Her foot. The ball weaved through the grass and caught on something. The Wheel of Fortune card lay where it had fallen a few days ago. It seemed to the girl that a faint smile was playing on the ancient Roman goddess's face. Or maybe she didn't. Maybe Blind Fortune really did smile at her with her strange and mysterious smile. When do teenage girls turn into swift swallows or faces? Writing in a French Camillet essay, they begin to dream of dreams with young officers, lavish balls, sleepless nights, and chance encounters in the city garden. They dream of the good party their father will eventually pick for them. I won't be crooked to say that Artemis is indifferent to love and all those romantic girls, but it's obvious that none of us consider marriage the meaning of our lives. When Artemis turns 15, 
She's waiting for an invitation to her first internship. It could be a fishing village or a troupe of traveling circus performers, an imperial palace in China or a skyscraper in downtown Manhattan. Practice teaches us to adjust and get used to life outside the shelter among ordinary people. Each of us must appear as a star, attracting the attention of passersby, must charm, delight, be on the radar without arousing suspicion. That's the way it's been for the last 20 years. But the world is changing. There's a strike in America. Ladies are getting behind the wheel. Women are increasingly being taken seriously, which hurts our cause. Where a few years ago a gorgeous and intelligent woman at a ball elicited nothing but applause, now she's attracting more and more curious stares. Something is wrong with her. That is why Stephen himself has noticed that in modern conditions the traditions of Artemis need to be revised. Sometimes it's better to hide and lurk, to be unremarkable and gray like me. She wrote and laid aside her quill. She glanced at the convex mirror hanging on the wall. Staring back at her was a fully grown girl of average height, tanned from power, unremarkable except for her greenish eyes, framed by their long black lashes beneath her eyebrow points. Her hair grew terribly slowly and barely reached her shoulder blades. She twisted them and ordered them with a Chinese body pin. It turned out so-so, nothing special. Well, no wonder she wasn't getting taken anywhere, either for practice or a real mission. Less than a year away from her 18th birthday, and she never left the orphanage during her stay, had visited the village nearby and sneaked out a few times to the adjacent mountain peaks. Outside the window, the horses were roaring. The girl jumped up on the bed, opened the window and sticking her head out, saw Camille. She was riding in the river, hiding under her hat. Everyone was sure that she would never return to the orphanage. She'd gone to her first internship when she was barely 14. She was never heard from again for two years. Artemis already thought she had passed all the exams and was now on a mission. But they were wrong. Camille, who was almost prayed for by the teachers, adored by Mrs. Vanessa, and even Stephen himself, failed in the exam silently, without greeting the crowd surrounding her, got off the river and was ready to go into the house as Gloria appeared on the threshold. A star shone again in our humble sky. She smiled broadly. Congratulations. Welcome back. I heard you failed too. Camille cut her off. If one could kill with a look, Gloria would be lying breathless by now. They say you've been placed as governess to a nice French family. And you inadvertently flattered their eldest son. It really was an accident. Gloria made an angelic face. Young men are so unrestrained these days. What did you fall asleep on? Watch your nose. And don't shove it where you don't want it. Camille tossed Igor's shoulder, going inside. She sat down on the bed and sighed. If even these girls who were gifted at everything failed, then what to speak of her? The girl walked over to the toilets and table and pulled out a drawer. From there she pulled out three shiny medals. She'd gotten one for saving Zoe, one for her work, and one last year for staging a ballet. There was also an old green cartouch lying there as a reminder of the world from which Artemis Paul had come here. There was a knock at the door and a moment later Zoya was lying unceremoniously on the bed, sweeping at the air with her feet and barely containing her delight. Did you hear that Camille is back? She began hotly. Mum, mum. Only I said, no, put the medals back in the drawer discreetly. Why, is mistress giving us an astronomy quiz at the end of the week? Yeah, I know. The girl brushed it off, not in the mood to talk about her studies. Camille rolled her classmates' eyes, the former seventh grader really clinging to her as if she were her own, and that Stephen is coming for a month and taking some of the older girls to Russia. You know about that too. This time, Anna Nidzi moaned as if pondering. I think he'll definitely pick you. You understand, shrugged Camille. Let her do whatever she wants. No matter how long I sit over my books, I can never be like you. Look, sometimes I think you just don't know how to be happy about small victories, quirky zo or joy in general. If I go on a mission, Camille finally smiled, I'll bring you back some goodies. If you go on the mission, 
Slowly Hare replied in an unexpectedly serious tone, Zoya, then you will pass the exam and never come back here again. The main hall of the palace was flooded with electric light. A festively dressed Artemis was waiting for the appearance of Stephen and Mademoiselle Vanessa to begin at last the gala dinner on the occasion of the latter's birthday. And when Stephen, on the arm of the director, finally entered the Artemis Hall, the prizes rose from their seats, greeting the birthday girl, clad in a lush and bright red dress. My dear Artemis, began Stephen affectionately, gesturing for everyone to be seated. He had aged even more in recent years, beaming with grief, but he had not lost the milky gleam in his eyes. Today we are honoring our oldest Artemis, cautiously clarified the chief guardian, but by experience. But before we start celebrating, I would like to please Mademoiselle Vanessa with a gift. This gift is my experiment. The first Artemis Orphanage spy team mission. The girls whispered, that's right. Before, each of you would get an individual mission, and after passing all the practical exams, you would become a loner, knowing that you all wanted to escape from the orphanage as soon as possible and start your adult life. This time, it's the likes of Artemis that will get the chance. Stephen paused and the girls held their breath. The person who is best with cars and cameras picks up a rifle in seconds and runs the 100-meter dash the fastest. Emily. The girls exclaimed. The hall applauded loudly, and the girl only smiled modestly in response, fixing her enviable brown hair, a face that, despite her small stature, would not be afraid to face two or even three clean-cut men in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It would be hard to name a science with which this young lady was unfamiliar. The best orators are silenced when this girl talks politics and civil rights. Camille, voices shouted. Emily hugged her friend in joy, and she cast a barely perceptible triumphant glance at Gloria. A person born with a revolver in his hands is capable in mathematics and chess, so deftly calculates winning combinations and gambling. The hall laughed. Now everyone was already looking at Gloria with envy and, and hidden delight, all except Camille Sr., in the depths of whose eyes trembled indignation and real terror. I'm not going with her. She jumped up from her seat, and everyone turned their heads to her at once. Sit down. Stephen's voice hammered Camille back into her chair. No one gave you the right to vote. You even failed the elementary exam. He went on, steady and calm. And the last member of the group, the face that managed to unite, instead of disuniting the face on which I pin a lot of hopes, does not burn in the fire and is not afraid of heights. Paul shouted Camille classmates, clapping her joyfully on the shoulders. She herself is sitting at the table, and Javania is dead. She's on her way to fulfill the mission. Paul. Really? Gloria Ioana exclaimed with one voice. Yeah. Newsflash. Girls, Emily couldn't take it. Taking on the responsibilities of a senior, take this as just another adventure. All four looked around warily, pointedly. My dear birds, Stephen addressed them. Already tomorrow, I'll ask you to pack your bags and prepare for the whirlpool. Until then, are you celebrating? Our cooks have done a great job today. Artemis, you took up knives and forks, poured cherry kissel, the gramophone played Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and Mademoiselle Vanessa laughed her beautiful chesty laugh, answering Sam's joke. Only the four girls couldn't swallow a bite of the roast. The adventure they were looking forward to dreading and fantasizing about would begin tomorrow. It was this adventure that brought them to that ill-fated cafe in the dressmaker's shop. She met her mother, and there was no end to her happiness. After the punishment, it turned out that she did not fail in her mission and cunningly beat off her friends in advance, let down one foreigner. Everything happened rapidly. To the task she approached quite ingeniously. She threw out to sit until morning with the child prima ballerina of her old acquaintance, and late at night sat at the bar, where she walked knee to her object. He was suspected of espionage, and it was necessary to search his apartment, so as not to leave any trace. The foreigner went out for a smoke, and saw a woman in tears sitting on a bench in the distance. A baby was crying frantically. Young lady, 
It's not right to make a mistake here. You should go home. My husband had too much to drink and attacked me. I barely escaped. There's nowhere to go. She sobbed fake, but quite naturally. Here you go. It's not far. The foreigner held out a bunch of keys and dictated his address. You go ahead. I'm not going home tonight. I had a little rendezvous with a lady, and in the morning we'll go and see your husband. She had no trouble getting home. It only took her 300 hours to find the stash. She took the files with her and left the apartment door unlocked. Mission accomplished. The agent came back, barely crossed the threshold, couldn't believe his eyes. The rug on the floor had been moved. He had been so careless in his drunken stupor, trusting a woman with a baby. How could he have stumbled like that? Frantically, he peeled at the carpet. The man checked the stash. It was empty. Taking a deep breath, the spy pulled a vial from behind his sinus and drank it in a gulp. Business and life were over for him. The rest of Artemis had already disgraced. The brilliant maiden prodigies had to return to the orphanage. They had failed their exam, but the case united them. They no longer quarreled. A stellar farewell took place in the evening. The girls knew that the same Paul would be at the ball. The handsome man who had lived for years in the imagination of the now beautiful Camille. Gloria whispered angrily in her friend's ear. So unfair. We've all fought the ghosts of our past to the end. And you're staying for the last day. I've accomplished the mission. That's not where the mission is. Gloria pointed to the door where Stephen was drinking tea in the next room. Is she here? The blonde put her hand to her heart. No matter how fast you run away from her, you still can't escape. I know. Gloria opened the closet, took out from there a green dress, worthy of a Roman goddess, pearls, and a good hat. Where did you get it all? Camille was surprised. Working in a brothel has its perks. So what kind of lipstick should you wear with that dress? The girls arrived early. Jenna Kijewski, and Nina's mom was already waiting for her daughter, happily shaking hands with the others. Artemis. And then a young man appeared at the entrance, dressed in a simple light-colored shirt and a summer jacket. Silver cufflinks gleamed on his sleeves, and his shoes were clean to a shine. Even under the shadow of his hat, Camille could recognize his face, make out the familiar thin features of his chin and nose, his achingly familiar silhouette. Gloria elbowed Camille. It hurt. Would you like to come over and say hello? She only shook her head negatively. If you dislike this officer so much, can I have him for myself? It wasn't told. He even came to the hotel. What's it gonna be, a black eye or different hair? No, but Officer Paul has already raised his head to the stands and smiling affably, waved to the girls. Madam, your daughter is such a psycho turned to her mother, Gloria. Can you imagine? She's afraid to confess to the guy she's in love with. I think it's her low self-esteem. She exhaled sharply from his painting like a balloon. It seemed to her that if she didn't, she would burst with anger or outright scratch Gloria's eyes out. But after all, her truth, Gloria was right. Handing her umbrella to her mother, Camille picked up the hem of her long dress and walked quickly down the stairs. Gendarmerie officer Paul stood like that at the entrance to the sports complex, watching with misty eyes as a short-haired young lady in gloves and a high-heeled hat came down to him. He had 1,000 confirmations. Her mother was standing at the podium, but the staff captain still couldn't believe it was really her. I came to thank you for your help. You're beautiful, he said, and grabbed Camelite's hand. After another moment, he was already running down the street and dragging the girl with him. Hey, let me go. Camille begged, confronted the officer. You have no right. Is that so? What are you? What right do you have to disappear and reappear in my life? His eyes and disappeared. Tears glistened in the military man's eyes. I missed you so much. I loved you so much. Don't ask me anything. A girl came in. I won't be able to answer you and tomorrow I disappear again. So there's no point. Give me an answer to just one question. Why did you really come down to see me? Because I love you. It wasn't the sunlight that touched the ice. 
It was the look in his yellowish walnut eyes. And there wasn't really any ice, only the fear of letting her so close to him again and saying goodbye forever again.